Buddha once compared sensory input being like a, a flayed cow with no skin. Anywhere the cow goes, insects bore into its flesh all the time. Our senses are constantly picking up information. Eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body. And on top of that, the mind has its own sense. Picks up all kinds of ideas. And the question is, how are you going to find any peace in the midst of all that? And the answer is, you have to be selective. The Buddha talks about restraint of the senses as being one of the very essential parts of meditation. We often think of meditation as what starts as soon as you sit down and close your eyes. But actually it's going on all the time. The word for meditation, bhavana, means to develop. You should stop and look. What are you developing in your mind? When you follow certain trains of thought, you develop the habits that go along with that train of thought. You create ruts in the mind. So the next time you get anywhere near that thought or that pattern of thinking, the mind falls into the rut and goes along with it. And we're doing this all the time. They've done studies to show how selective our process of perception is. And it happens on many levels, this process of selection. Some of it's conscious, some of it's not. But the end result is, if you have been developing the wrong kinds of habits, then when you sit down to close your eyes, you're already in a process of developing. The question is, is it developing the same thing the meditation is meant to develop? Are you developing calm, or are you developing turmoil. Are you developing mental stability or are you developing restlessness? So look at this all the time. Everything you do, everything you say is a process of developing something. It's laying those ruts in the mind. Do you want good what kind of ruts do you want? We're trying to work on good ones as we sit here with our eyes closed, but if the rest of the day you're working on other kinds of ruts, it's, it's a struggle. When you look at things, what are you looking for? For who's doing the looking? Is lust doing the looking? Is anger doing the looking? If these things are doing the looking, they create the ruts for more anger or more lust or whatever to keep on doing the looking. So throughout the course of the day, be careful what you look at. This doesn't mean you can't look at good-looking things. It's just that when you see something good-looking, you have to remind yourself that there's another side to it as well. When you see something you really hate, remind yourself, well, there's another side to that as well. As John Lee used to say, be a person with two eyes. The same applies to your listening, what you smell, what you taste, what you touch, and especially what you think about. It's a common pattern that when you're sitting here meditating, you try to keep the mind under control, and then as soon as you get up, then it's back to its old ways, just wandering around any place it wants to. And that way you're being inconsistent. If the mind is going to go someplace, you have to ask yourself, why are you going there? It's like that old slogan from World War II, is this trip really necessary? Where are you planning to go? What are you planning to bring back? 
be deliberate in your thinking. The Buddha is not saying not to think, he's just saying have a sense of why you're thinking, what it's going to accomplish. The same with the looking and the listening. Have a sense of why you're looking at something, what it's going to accomplish by looking at it. Why you listen to certain things. All of this is part of the meditation, part of the practice. Because you're creating the environment in your mind. And you want to make sure you're creating the right environment. Get your priorities in order. And this way the meditation is less an attempt at a little island or a little pool of calm in the midst of all kinds of storms. And it's more part of an ongoing process, realizing the mind needs to be trained. And the training is a full-time process, even when you're out in the world, not here at the monastery. You've got to look at where your mind is going, what it's picking up. It's especially important what it's picking up, because there are all kinds of weird messages out there. As soon as you turn on the TV, pick up a newspaper, pick up a magazine, the question should always be, why do these people want me to believe this? So you don't fall for these, for the messages, for the values. And if there's a feeling that this makes you a stranger in your surroundings, well, it's, sometimes it's good to be a stranger, not to pick up everything. One of the advantages of going over to Thailand was just that. No matter how much you were absorbed in the society and the culture and the language, there was still part of you that was an outsider. And that outside perspective is always important. Sometimes it helps you keep your sanity. Because it's that outsider perspective. That's the that's your guide inside. That's your inner teacher. The Buddha talks about the traditions of the noble ones or the customs of the noble ones. It's like making you a person with one foot in two different cultures. The noble ones look at material things and they say, well, just remember there's all that suffering that goes into just providing food, clothing, and shelter. So don't get all wrapped up in having lots of food, lots of clothing, a big house. Remember that those things have their drawbacks. So the world out there is saying, bye, bye, bye. The noble ones are saying, well, no, no. There's a phrase in the Dhammapada, the people who see shame in what's not shameful or see no shame in what is shameful. Again, that's learning how to be bicultural. So then when they push all kinds of materialistic ideals, this part of you can say, no, you're not sucked into those things. And as a result, the mind has a lot more peace. This part of the world that sees being moral, having principles, not fighting tooth and claw to get lots of belongings. They see that as shameful, as something to be embarrassed about. That's why you've got to get out of that culture. This is why we have the culture of the noble ones. And so that voice of restraint inside, that's going to be your protection. Just a matter of learning how to listen to it, strengthening it. So that restraint in day-to-day -day life gets 
reflected in the restraint of your meditation. You're going to focus on one thing, and you can stay there because you're used to exercising restraint in a healthy way. Knowing how much you can rein the mind in when there are times when you have to give it a little extra, extra leash. Just so it doesn't feel too confined, to feel too cooped up. But at the same time, knowing how much is too much. This is something you have to learn over time. So think about the environment you're creating in your mind, the environment that allows the mind to settle down, the values that allow it to settle down, so that when disturbing thoughts arise, you don't immediately go with them. You look at them and say, that's not a thought I want to follow. And you're used to saying no to it already, so it gets easier to say no to it when you're sitting here with your eyes closed, focusing on the breath, and vice versa. When you've got your eyes open, you can remind yourself, I've, I've been able to overcome this thought before. I've been able to say no to it. And I haven't died. And this way you can maintain your mental health. And the meditation really does become an ongoing process of developing. Developing the skillful qualities you want, mindfulness, alertness, a sense of calm. a sense of wholeness in the mind. A sense of well-being, for as the Buddha said, the mind well-trained brings happiness. It needs to be trained because it's always doing things. So make sure that it's doing is in line with where you want to go.